Chapter 25, November 1987. The three of us are sitting in Patrick's little kitchen at the same teak table that we ate upon during our marriage of long ago. Mother and I together on one side, Patrick across from her. I wonder which of the many nicks in its oiled surface were made by me, by the boys when they were small. Both the table and the kitchen counters had been cleared off, the seemingly haphazard stacks of books and papers now piled elsewhere in this cluttered little house. Clearly, Patrick has prepared to receive us. Mother and I have brought a bottle of wine, cheese, and crackers. The three of us are busying ourselves with opening the wine, arranging the cheese and crackers on a plate. Embarrassed. Can't look at each other in the eye. How to proceed? The air feels thick, pregnant with coiled energy. Patrick and my mother are obviously nervous. I may look nervous, too, on the surface. Underneath, however, I am in an altered state, having come fully prepared for this occasion. Switch to three months earlier. Midnight, August 18th, 1987. Harmonic Convergence. I am in a large ceremonial space with 50 others, all of us spinning like dervishes. All of a sudden, I hear a voice from deep within my being, booming loud and clear. You are to finish your personal karma by the end of the year. What? The message is repeated as loudly as before. No, no, I know exactly what the voice is referring to. I refuse to do it. I will not go back and see Patrick, that awful man poisoning my children against me all this time. Over the following weeks, I gradually grow used to the idea, and when my mother agrees to accompany me, I discover an actual gladness inside, relief that the long-held hostility between us is about to move. Not that I know how to move it, Indeed, I have no idea. All I know is this is what I have to do now, that if I am willing, then somehow an opening will be created for the occasion. I call up an old friend who still lives near Boston and with whom I shared much in our mutual childbearing days. Joyfully, Nancy agrees to serve as go-between for this momentous occasion. She contacts my older son, Sean, invites him to dinner, and tells him of my desire. He agrees to serve as go-between with his father, arranging the meeting with me. Sean and Patrick have not been in contact with Colin for a year, and so on impulse, one weekend they hop in Sean's little sports car and drive to Washington, D.C. to find him. Meanwhile, I have given the problem of how to be with Patrick to my unconscious mind, told it that if it wants me to do this, it had better let me know how. I busy myself with other affairs, pausing once in a while to bring the subject up to consciousness. Gradually, during this process, I notice a subtle sea change taking place internally. Instead of hating Patrick as usual, I find myself feeling him, feeling inside him, who he is and was, what he has been going through. I begin to feel his vulnerability, his hurt, his pain, feel him as a small child, only five years old when his father died and his mother handed him over to a housekeeper while she went to work. As I began to touch into my own tender child the year before, so now I am feeling Patrick's child, his own trauma of abandonment, he and I are one in our pain. Since both of us were harboring the secret suffering of childhood when we married, we unconsciously caused our own children to experience the same suffering of abandonment. As the one who left the impossible situation of our marriage, I took all the blame. I felt guilty, and Patrick made sure that I did. My leaving him triggered his old pain, and he reacted in blaming anger to cover up the original hurt. That anger is still there, 20 years later, and by now it has hardened his face into cement. 
I look across at him. I think back to how he greeted us this afternoon. His genuine joy in seeing my mother again, the formal frozen stiffness as he then turned his head to look at me. Hello, Anne, he said slowly, teeth clenched, voice dripping with scorn. But it doesn't matter how he greeted me or that his body was stiff with pride as I tried to hug him. Intuitively, I knew this would happen. I knew the entire scenario, how it would take place, and told my mother so on the way down here in the rented car. He is going to spill out all the rage and anger he has had toward me over all these years, I said to her. I am simply going to sit there while he does this and not defend myself. You don't have to say a thing. Your role is simply to sit there too as witness. She didn't understand, and she was scared and acutely comfortable at the prospect of this meeting. But, dear woman, she had agreed to come. And now here we were, hurtling in a rental car towards my rendezvous with destiny. The cheese and crackers are arranged. The wine opened and poured. Awkward silence. Suddenly my mouth opens, and slowly, full of feeling, the words roll out. Patrick, we are here to talk about whatever you need to talk about. Permission has been given. The floodgate opens. The venom pours out, at first slowly, hesitantly, then rising to repeating crescendos, hurtling insults. How awful a mother I have been. How he and the boys suffered so. Hour upon hour of this. I sit there. My mother sits there. I am not defended against him. I am there for him. I receive his rage and neutralize it, release the residue into the atmosphere. Each time he pauses to catch his breath before the next onslaught, my mouth opens again, and my voice delivers to him something for which I am truly grateful. I am really glad you were able to give the kids discipline when I could not. Or, the house you designed for my parents was wonderful. Its spaces changed the family dynamic. Each time I do this, he sputters, cannot believe his ears. Each time I repeat it to make sure he hears. The detailing of my sins goes on and on, endless, interspersed with my loving comments. At one point, he gives me a great teaching. I have suddenly gripped his forearm with my hand, startling him into stopping the tirade. I have just said to him, in a low, intense voice, almost a whisper, Patrick, we've got to get over this. At this, he turns and sees me for the first time, the glaze in his eyes dispersing to reveal his soul. For that one long and holy moment in the entire history of our relationship, his soul reaches out to mine and he says in a voice as low and slow as my own, Anne, you can't go too fast. The space opened by that moment then quickly shut down. His venom was not yet spent. For another hour he droned on, though the energy in him was obviously dissipating. Finally, at the close of four full hours, Mother stood up, said that was enough. She couldn't take it anymore. As we left, I hugged him again, and this time, even though his voice was still berating me, I felt his body clinging to mine. The frozen, emotional wasteland had warmed up. Our bodies had begun to vibrate together. The deed was done. I walked out of that house exultant. My mother was devastated. I spent the hours returned to Boston helping her to reinterpret what had happened and thanking her for being there. Subsequent meetings with both Patrick and our children after that fierce initiation became more and more relaxed, all of us glad the wall had been torn down. Colin has since moved to live near me in Wyoming. We get together once in a while. Sean calls and comes to visit. Patrick and I talk on the phone about our kids, how they're coming along.
Chapter 26, March 1989. The four of us are sitting at the round oak table in the suburban living room. My lover, his two children, and me. He has fixed us this Sunday dinner and is justly proud. My lover wolfs down a portion of baked chicken and potatoes, asking his daughter in, in a perfunctory, distracted manner about her day. She starts to answer him, but he is not there. She stops, looks at me, shrugs her shoulders, goes back to eating. He is finished. Suddenly shoves his chair back and gets up. Approximately ten minutes after we sat down, he is already done and gone. I feel vaguely uncomfortable. His action has upset me on a subliminal level. It always does. He always does this at dinner time when I'm there, eats in a few minutes flat, and then gets up in a hurry to start the dishes. He rinses his plate, utensils, and water glass, the pots and pans from dinner, letting them clatter loudly, opens the dishwasher door, bends over, places the dishes in the partially filled dishwasher, rearranging to fit. My lover and my mother, filling and rearranging the same type of dishwasher with a 40-year span between them. Same type of sunny, cheerful kitchen in relatively new suburban house. Looks are deceptive. The nuclear families of my childhood have exploded, fissioning into fragments, blowing forlornly in the wind. Though to all appearances we are a family, man and woman and two children in this suburban house today, the invisible lines of force that formerly connected us as families have shattered to leave us uneasy and trying not to show it. Each of us hiding within a glass bell jar, insulated, isolated, burdened with a history of broken dreams, moving slowly through the dream time in shock, responses muted, trying to cope, wondering about the future, trying not to dwell on the past, longing for security, connectedness, pretending everything is okay. The sign of him bending over the dishwasher has put me into reverie. I snap back, hurry to finish eating. The kids are both doing the same. We all feel vaguely guilty for not being done yet, and yet upset with him for making us feel like we should finish sooner. His daughter told me the first day I spent alone with her that he never did the dishes when he was married to her mother, that he didn't do any of the housework. My mother did it all. After a full day of work herself, sometimes she was up until late at night getting everything done. He never did the dishes when he was married, and yet he always does them when I'm there. Doesn't like me to do them. Doesn't like me in his kitchen. Now it's his kitchen. She's gone away to school, and the kids are living with him for two years. He's had to learn to do the dishes, and he doesn't want any help. His behavior is extreme. Instinctively, I feel it as a reaction to the past. Not because he feels guilty that he didn't do them before, not because he's now a reformed macho male, but because he doesn't want me taking the role of wife in his house, the same house they lived in as a family for 10 years. He is still so traumatized by his long and difficult marriage that two years later, he tends to see me only as the woman out to get him, become his wife and trap him like the first one did. I know how he feels. He feels the same way I felt with Dick, caught in the mechanics of expected social roles. I know how it feels to be unable to see through the role to reality, to be unable to relate as one unique and utterly free being to another. He is still so conditioned by society, including the Catholicism of his childhood, that he feels that once a man and woman get together, either it isn't going anywhere or... It is into marriage, and marriage is a trap. So, I tell him, you've set it up so that you have only two choices, both of them unacceptable. Either you're free and lonely, or you're married and trapped. 
He hears me, or I think he does. A part of him does, but most of him is still mired in guilt. Guilt for leaving the marriage, causing pain to his children. Guilt which masks his pain and ultimately his rage, his terror, the same rage and terror we all feel when our true selves have not been allowed to flourish. The same rage and terror I feel when I look at him and feel the wall he has set up around himself. Guilt immobilizes him. He is stuck, stuck in stereotyped responses, stuck in even the way he moves, walks around the world like a marionette, head down, arms barely moving, shoulders hunched, protecting his heart. Makes me want to shake him, shock him, rip off the blinkers he doesn't know he's wearing and which blind him to the extraordinary opportunity each of us has to unfold from tight little buds of possibility into the glorious expressiveness of full flowering. His guilt makes me furious, frustrated, no, I cannot control him, change him. Phil taught me that. But since I see through what he's up against and the pain and alienation it causes him to be there, I have a terrible time not following my desire to just sit him down, slap some sense in him. There it is, my violence again. Violence disguised as altruism. A violence born of my own still desperate childhood need to have someone there for me I long to be with him, to come into a real connection with him, and he is walled off from me and from his own children by the unrecognized, unprocessed pain of his past. I attempt to help him see himself, where he is now in his life, so that he can see through the past, let go of it, allow the present to fill him with the magic of infinite possibility, the sheer humming vitality of life at its prolific peak, so that he can feel me as I am, right here, right now, so that we can begin the sacred journey, freely opening to the mystery within ourselves as reflected in the other. When my help is not accepted, it turns, subtly or not so subtly, into an attempt to control. Is there any end to my learning this same lesson? New college, Phil, peace activist, and now this new scenario. I know how he feels. I feel his guilt, his pain, but my compassion for him clashes with my own emotional need for him to be there for me as my lover, as the one who would go with me into the dark heart of night, into the brilliant light of day. I am ready for relationship in a larger sense than marriage, or what has passed as marriage in the second half of the 20th century. Oh yeah, says a little voice, if you were really, really ready, wouldn't you have attracted a man who was too? Are there any? Oh God, don't think that way. Shake off the little voices. Yes, I am ready. He is not. I must accept this. I do not accept it. This is the dilemma. For though he is not ready for me in his mind, his body meets mine in trust and abandon. Though far apart in our manner of perceiving the world, our felt sense of the world within our bodies is the same. It calls us, magnetizes us into our more wild, primal selves, the deep and mysterious source of life within where we are and move as one. Joined at the hip, we lean far back, the distance between our faces a measure of the chasm that mentally prevents us from full alignment. That same Sunday afternoon, his son takes me to see his wikia, a secret spot in the willows lining a stream in a meadow about six blocks from home. He has cut willow branches and heaped them overhead to make a protective covering the way the Indians did. Sometime next summer, he tells me, he wants to spend the night there. I am honored that, like his sister, he is beginning to trust me with matters close to his heart. When we return, his father is sprawled on the couch in the living room, flipping television channels, looks bored, depressed. I go into the bedroom to gather my things, feel sorry for the children. They're having to live with this man who is hiding from his pain and beneath that his buried rage 
over having been denied his God-given creativity as a child. Glad to get out of there. Glad to be out of harm's way. Chapter 27, March 1989. Go home to my yurt, one of ten small, round, cozy dwellings sitting on sagebrush-covered land directly across the valley from the majestic Grand Tetons. Sunday night. Time to clean up. Time to do the dishes, which have been piling up for several days in the stainless steel bowl. Hoist the bowl to my left shoulder, grab an empty water jug in my right hand, and walk to the bathhouse, where we yurt dwellers share kitchen and bathroom facilities. Do the dishes, fill the jug, walk back home. That night I have a dream. There is a new dwelling being built for a family of four, two adults and two children. The original dwelling is an underground yurt. Many people are involved, all in a celebratory mood. They are building a huge wickiup, using nature to enclose nature. The wickiup will shelter both the entrance to the original yurt, where the children will continue to live, and a brand new white yurt being built for the adults. Inside the new yurt, it feels quiet and peaceful. There is a bed there and a round table with two chairs. In the dream, I'm off to the side doing the dishes, watching the construction of all this, loving it, thinking it's a great idea, spaces within spaces, a good way to expand the space for this family. There are lots of people here, lots of dishes to do. I do them for a long time. A good dream, I think, recalling it the next morning. The key to the working through of the difficulties in learning how to become a family in this fractured world is the responsibility of the adults, whose new white yurt symbolizes the peace and quiet of what could be. I am startled by my role in the dream. Why am I not directly involved in building the wiki of the new yurt? One month later, another dream. Again with the theme of doing the dishes, but this time with a diabolical twist. In the second dream, I'm in the kitchen of the house we lived in when I was eight years old, the year I did the dishes to get the horse. George Blastos is there, getting ready to leave for Greece. Phil Lohman is there, too, going with him. Thank God, I think, though I can't imagine how George can tolerate him. They leave. George's car roars off. Oh, no, Phil did not go with him. Here he comes, back inside. I tell him, you're not staying here. He says he can stay in a friend's house across the street. He leaves. I lock the front door, go downstairs to lock another door down there with an outside entrance. Notice the lock isn't very good. It's dark and spooky down there. Come back upstairs. Phil is in the kitchen, doing his dishes in my kitchen. I am furious and scared, especially when he brandishes a huge knife at me while he talks. I tell him he's not to stay here. I shove him aside and do the dishes myself. Don't want him doing his dishes in this sink as if he belongs here. All the while, he's talking double talk. I ask him where he's going to stay. He says, here. I say, no, you're not. He says, I mean here in this town. I say, what about across the street? He says, no, not there. Says he left his truck somewhere, had better go get it. Dream ends with me thinking, how can I get rid of him? I'll never get rid of him. The fact that both dreams contain the theme of doing the dishes leads me to link them together in meaning. In both dreams, doing the dishes seems to be symbolic of something else. The way this small daily ritual activity has always been symbolic for me, starting with doing the dishes to get the horse. For most people, this activity is decidedly not symbolic. They do the dishes without thinking, get it over with as soon as possible, or they procrastinate, hoping others will do them first, or waiting until the sink is so full they cannot avoid doing them. Doing the dishes is one of those small daily chores that, because it's so repetitive, it's considered totally uninteresting. There are very few people like me who actually like to do the dishes, who ground themselves there, feet planted firmly, hands warmed in the hot water. 
there are fewer still who both sense and appreciate the ritual rhythm of any daily routine, how it provides continuity within a rapidly changing world. Like most females, I've done the dishes on a nearly daily basis since I was a small child. And every day, the me who stands there doing them is subtly changed from the day before. The very repetition of the act sets up a relatively constant framework within which differences can be discerned. Usually the differences are subtle, shifts in mood, in rhythm and pace of moving. Sometimes the differences are radical, shifts in actual being, resulting in heightened or lowered awareness. These shifts then projected out to create the many and various settings within which doing the dishes has taken place. No matter what the changes, doing the dishes has remained a symbolic constant. Now, in my 46th year, as when I was eight years old, this routine daily activity, on a subconscious level, is linked to my will to getting what I want. As a child, it was a simple matter of setting the goal and going after it directly and with resolute determination. And the goal invariably was something in the outside world that I wanted to incorporate into myself. Now, as the first dream seems to attest, the goal I envisage must be approached obliquely. I do not participate directly in building the wiki up and the yurt. Instead, I'm off to the side, doing the dishes. My role is to serve from behind the scenes, not as architect or guide. And though there is an outside goal, the uniting of these four people as family, the opening of space for them to share, the fact that this goal cannot be approached directly is indicative, I think, that the real goal here is an internal one. Once again, I am to undergo a shift in being, this time a transformation in my way of relating to any outside goal whatsoever. Somehow, while fully engaged in the act of desiring, I must also let go of the object of that desire, must learn to open myself to receive what I desire while not trying to force it to come towards me, must express myself as I truly am while not demanding anything from others. The second dream shows me the shadow side of myself, the one who has not made that internal shift, the consequences of that native stubbornness, fear, and conflict, the power struggle with Phil, being afraid I'll never get rid of him, wrestling control through pushing him aside to do his dishes. Phil is my shadow, an outgrowth of the experience of my inner child, Orphan Annie. Her need to control is a survival tactic born of her sense of abandonment and the consequent desperate fear of not getting what she needs from the world. Currently, I am still off to the side doing the dishes. There are a lot of dishes to do. I will be doing them for a long, long time. I both wish and fear the current goal to surrender to the universe, to fully trust the wisdom of the process I am undergoing, no matter what the outcome in the external world, to find my balance within a felt sense of my own personal cycles and how they harmoniously interface with other larger and smaller ones. Doing the dishes centers me in the present time. As I surrender to the discipline of this small repeating cycle, the boundary system of the cycle effaces to become a membrane permeable to larger cycles within which it and I are centered. The present moment is not a point, but a space, and this space expands and contracts depending upon my awareness my capacity to discern dimensional differences. I struggle with the fill inside me. I struggle with my inner child's need to control the course of events. I still experience her feelings of panic, of suffocation, of abandonment. Every day I do the dishes. Every day I plant my feet firmly on the ground and wash off the remains of today's bodily nourishment. In washing the plates, I continue to clear myself of the remains of past trauma so that I can open further to resonate with the singing of the birds, their announcement of yet another new dawn breaking, 
another day's dishes, secure framework guiding this slowly moving sea change within.